Welcome back to the Young Shakespeare Podcast. Today, I have the privilege of talking to Princeton All Ivy wide receiver Jacob Bermelin. Jake, thanks so much for coming on the show, dude. Dan, thank you for having me. How does it feel to be an Ivy League champion? It feels great. Um, you know, this is a feeling that I got back in 2018 um, in that perfect season. And, you know, just all the hard work that we put in all the time. And obviously, I'm sure you know about the year that we took off, you know, the 17 seniors that came back. Um, you know, all the sacrifices we made, you know, we, we know that nothing is, is, was given to us. You know, we didn't deserve anything per se. Um, so we had to work for it all. And, you know, for all of our, you know, trials and tribulations, the, the benefits have been all that, you know, we expected and that we wanted. Yeah. How did you come down to that decision? Obviously you mentioned you were among that group of guys that had to say, well, Hey, am I going to come back for a year with the eligibility and all that stuff? How did you make that call? Um, you know, it was really a unanimous decision um, along, at least for the starters. Um, we were in a zoom with our AD and, you know, it, up, up until that point, it had just been bad news after bad news after bad news. Like, you know, we had spring break early, I guess, you know, kind of looking back now, that might've been good news to a lot of people, but we had to take all our exams on, 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 uh, you know, online and, um, and then after that, you know, we were like, oh, okay, we're going to come back after spring break. And they said, nope, you're going to stay home for another month, do your classes online. And then, you know, we're in the middle of spring ball. So spring balls, you know, this is cutting into spring ball at this point. So that's why it was bad news for us is because we weren't practicing at all. And we just saw our spring ball just keep getting postponed and postponed. And eventually they said, all right, you're never coming back. You know, you're not coming back this year. Um, come back next year, maybe if things are better. And, you know, like I said, eventually later on, our AD gets on the Zoom with us and says, look, your season's canceled. And, um, you know, that was tough news for all of us, um, especially the guys that were already like fifth years. Um, this was the, really their last shot to come and play. And, you know, these guys are 22, 23 already. So those guys had to had to go off. And, um, you know, those are guys like John Orr, who was a, a star linebacker for us who couldn't come back and play. Um, Luke Tim, who was a receiver for us, who worked so hard to play that year. And, you know, for the, him not to get the opportunity, that really sucked. But for the rest of us that were, you know, true seniors, um, you know, we really just looked at each other and we didn't really have to talk about it very much. We hopped in our group chat that we had and we're just like, obviously took a second to mourn and took a second to kind of take it all in. But, mm -hmm. you know, we were all just like, we got to come back. You know, we can't end our career on our first. We only had one spring season, spring practice. They're like, and we're all just said, we all just said, look, we can't end like this. We got to we got to ring chase again, you know, we got to win something. So. Absolutely. And during this, you know, championship season uh, and obviously being all Ivy first team, you know, incredible for you. What was the win you're most proud of? Um, I mean, it's hard not to say Harvard, um, but I mean, honestly, every game that we play carries the same weight for us. So going in, it doesn't change anything, but, you know, retrospectively now, now that I'm not a Princeton football player anymore and I'm graduating or about to graduate. And um, I'd have to say Harvard was, Harvard was probably the, the best day of my life, if I'm being honest. Oh. <laughs> so, I mean, because just, just in how the, you know, the game went, um, going into the, uh, going to the end of the first half, um, they threw me a tunnel screen. I dropped it. It gets picked. They're in our red zone. Our defense holds them. You know, I forget what the score was at that point, but it was a really tight game. We go into the halftime. You know, I'm trying to forget about it, move on. Like, we have a whole other half to play. You play that half, um, you know, ups and downs all over the place. Um, ball game's tied. We're going to overtime, I'm, I'm sure, as I'm sure you know. Um, you know, first one doesn't do it. Second, third, fourth one doesn't do it. Fifth one comes around, and, you know, I make that play in the back of the end zone, um, which, dude, I mean, like, I can't even explain to you what the emotions were, like, what I saw, who I saw, I just went total blinders on. I don't remember. I barely remember anything. Uh, <laughs> it was an I amazing remember. catch, by the way. It was an amazing catch. I don't, I don't even know how it happened, dude. I'm like, if you go on my Instagram, you'll see all these Dharma players coming to 5'9", 5'7", 5'8", you know, call me short. I don't even know how I did that, dude. There's no reason I should have made that play, bro. <laughs> like, it was crazy. And, um, you know, obviously we go on to win that game. And, like, my family was there. My girlfriend was there. My best friends from high school were there. It was their first time ever coming to the Princeton game. And, you know, I just, it, it was just incredible. So not only was that the most memorable game, but that was probably the best day of my life. 
Wow. Yeah, it was an incredible game, five overtimes. We actually talked a little bit before the interview. There was some controversy around it. Some some of the Harvard guys vocal on social media disagreeing with the Ivy League statement. Um, what did you make of the whole controversy? And, you know, what were your thoughts on the Ivy League statement? Yeah, so, you know, kind of as we talked about before, um, I get – First off, I want to say I get where they're coming from. Um, and I told you, like, you know, if I was in their position, I would have been, you know, fighting tooth and nail, everything, you know, in the kitchen sink at the Ivy League to try to get that W in our column. Um, and, you know, when it when we first won and, you know, a couple of days go by, you know, we'd heard, you know, the controversy surrounding it. Um, but we, I mean, you know, wh what are we going to do? You know, we, we wanted to move on to our next game. We wanted to move on to Cornell already. You know, we didn't want to think about that. We didn't want to, we, we didn't want to even, you know, worry about that. Um, you know, and so, you know, we were already on to Cornell when the new information came out about, um, you know, and this circulated internally, um, you know, we didn't post it on the Ivy League or anything, you know, we didn't share it with anybody. We weren't going to go try to, you know, argue with, you know, the Harvard team or anything like that. But um, basically there was a rule that was circulated to where if a, if a timeout or any sort of significant occurrence alters the ending result of a game the referees are allowed to review that and allowed to enact how they prefer so um you know obviously in the fifth over or i don't remember what overtime it was when they scored but probably like third or fourth um you know coach race is running out on the field to go call a timeout i'm right behind him um and i remember this vividly and um you know the ref is facing the play the ball's about to get snapped and coach race is by the numbers almost you know calling the timeout i'm behind him screaming timeout 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 and so, you know, they go on and score whatnot. And like I said before, I mean, I don't even, you know, when they scored, I was like, there's no way. Like I, I was right behind my head coach as he's screaming timeout right before this mm. ball is called. You know, that should that play should not have occurred. Um, and you know, what what happened happened. And so yeah, I mean, they're 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 allowed to review it and you know, it's still a win in our book. Um, you know, and, you know, that rule that came out just kind of solidified everything. You know, we never really had any doubts about that win anyway. So it just kind of came out and assured us all, I guess. Right. And so you're saying that what you found in the NCAA rules contradicts what the Ivy League was saying, because I think in their statement, they said something like um, uh, calling or not calling a timeout can't be reviewed, basically. Right. And um, what was circulated to us was basically the opposite, I guess. Um, I actually, you know, haven't even, like I said, man, like after that game, I was total. I, I didn't even want to, you know, think about it. I'm on to Cornell. You know, they, if they want to keep talking about the Princeton game, they could keep talking about the Princeton game. They've got another game to do. You know, we were on our next game. And obviously that's easier to do when you won the game. Mm. Um, so, you know, like I said, like, you know, I would hate to be in their shoes and do, and, you know, I probably would have done the same thing as them, but um, you know, I, I never, you know, paid any mind to it. You know, I, I, they, they circulated it. I read it. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And moved on, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. You, you brought up too um, about people mocking your height and stuff like that. Cause yeah. I wanted to ask about that. Um, <clears throat> you know, being you're listed at like five, nine, one seventy, yeah. but you know, you've had a fucking great career at Princeton, 1500 all purpose yards, you're returning punts, you're catching game winners, you know, well, you know, how did you overcome your height? And is this like kind of an, I mean, it's something you kind of see more often now in football, these kind of smaller guys that, you know, are kind of shifty and can make moves like Edelman or Wes Welker, um, you know, what's it like playing as a smaller player and how do you make it work for you? So coach Flynn, our receiver coach, you know, always says to us, it's not about height. It's not about speed. It's not about weight you know, what you're pushing in the weight room, you know, nothing about that. It's about the receiver position is about generating space from your defender and getting open. So however you can do that, whatever way you want to do that, um, you know, that's, that's what really matters. If the quarterback can see you open and get you the ball, you know, for, for guys that are taller than me, it's okay. They might be a little bit more covered, but they can go up and get a, you know, go up and get a jump ball or something. I can't do that it's against Harvard. So, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so what I have to do is I have to, you know, really practice my releases. I have to practice getting separation from the defender, you know, getting any type of slight push off at the top of a route. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm short, you know, and I'm really not the fastest guy either. I'm quick. So I just have to use my quickness to 
get open, I guess. Yeah. So is that part of the kind of shit talking that goes on in the field? Like if someone's going to target you, is that kind of what they're saying? You said, did you say Dartmouth football players commented on your posts and stuff? Yeah. 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 Um, so after, after we lost to Dartmouth, um, I hadn't even gone on the bus yet. And I checked my phone on Instagram and I, you know, I had a couple, you know, DMS likes, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, typically after a game, like, I'll have some stuff from like Princeton football posting something it's tagging me or something like that. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. Cool. Or, or some of the ladies see from the stands. They're like, Oh, who's that? <laughs> yeah. And so like, I, I checked my phone and you know, I was like, okay, cool. Like I'll look at it on the bus. I get on the bus and like, it, it's doubled. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, like I get on there and you know, they're, you know, they're busting my chops and, you know, cause I, I'd be making these posts posts about like, you know, basically I'd say like incoming transcript or whatever. <laughs> the lights again there you go uh, and so I, I don't know they it it got a little bit of attention I guess I, I just went public actually on Instagram because I got an NIL deal with Liquid IV and they required me to go public and I, so I guess after I went public like some people saw it and I'm in the game at Dartmouth and they're up they're up now by you know a touchdown two touchdowns three touchdowns however much and they're all mocking me incoming transcript incoming transcript like it was funny. I mean, I don't really, you know, I don't take that stuff to heart. I would be doing the same thing if I was in their position. Like, that's just how the game goes. Mm. So, um, yeah, they were on my post after he lost. And then they were on my post again after the Penn game. Um, and that was when, you know, after the Dartmouth game, I didn't, I didn't reply to them at all. You know, because what can I say? We just got our ass kicked, you know. So, like, I'm going into, you know, after we beat Penn, you know, I'm saying, oh, you know, incoming transcript, this and that you know, where our rings or something like that, you know, just, you know, just talking my stuff and they comment again. And I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm not a Princeton football player anymore. Like I have, you know, I can, I can say what I want. So, you know, I started replying to them and like, it basically turned into like both teams, like the entire <laughs> team. It was, just, it, it was, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, honestly, like I have so much respect for those guys. And like, I do, you know, I post what I post, but like, you know, I'm never taking shots at anybody personally, you know, and like, um, you know, I, I respect all the teams that we play against, but, you know, that was just funny to see, you know, it was two, two of the top dogs, you know, going, there's a lot of emotions, a lot of tension in that game. Um, and so they took it to the, they took it to social media after the game. So I had to, I had to get back after them after we beat Penn. Yeah. And so for people that <clears throat> don't know you uh, on Instagram, the way you post is you say incoming transcript and it's kind of in like a different font and you're like incoming transcript from New Haven. Like we just, yeah, we just killed Yale or something like that. Yeah. And you know, it's funny cause it, I mean, it really just, I had to download a font for like a class um, and like some creative writing stuff. And like, um, you know, I was like, Oh, I, I'm on Instagram. I was about to make a post after we beat uh, we beat Stetson at home. And, you know, I see that the font can pop up on my iPhone too. So I just like started messing around with it and, you know, I just posted something. I was like, Oh, you know, that's kind of cool. Like I kind of like that. Um, and you know, I just did it for the rest of the year. And it was really, I mean, it's really kind of a joke. Like I don't really take myself that seriously. <laughs> so, so it's just kind of fun to do it. And, you know, I guess, you know, my friends like it and, you know, we talk about it. So um, that's kind of what it turned into. Yeah. How heated does it get into on the field? This is something that I love to ask players about, like what kind of things are said? I mean, D1 football, the intensity, it's just, you know, so high. What, what is the, the back and forth like? Um, it depends on the guy. I mean, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm never typically the first person to like start something. Um, I might, I might say a little something like, oh, you know, where are you going to like after I, you know, beat somebody on a route, you know, or something like that, like, where are you going to get a mat, you know, something like that, <laughs> you know, quirky or something like that. Um, but there are guys out there, man, I'll tell you, like, they're coming for your mom. They're coming for your family. Like it, 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 it's, you know, what everything's on the table, you know, you can say whatever you want. And, you know, we've got guys, you know, that do that, do that. I don't really do that too much. You know, if, if people come at me like that, I might say something like that, but um, I really, I, I really don't talk too much on the field. Um, and if anything, I'm having conversations with people, um, you know, like friendly conversations. So, um, you know, but we've got guys that <laughs> will, you know, like I said, everything's on the table. Any type, of, any type of smack talk they want to say, it's fair game for them. And other teams have exactly the same same type of mentality too. 
One thing I wanted to ask you about um, Princeton, a top program. You guys are uh, currently sitting at third place in NCAA championships. You've got 15. You're only mm-hmm. one behind Alabama. Is there any chance you guys can catch up? In the national championship? Yeah. We've got a pretty good recruiting class coming in, so maybe. <laughs> Yeah, and that's – well, that's a, in a, a serious question that I do always wonder about with the Ivy Leagues is, you know, you guys get to play other um, ranked FCS teams. So is there a thought of, like, hey, how far could we take it in the playoffs if we were given an opportunity, if we were eligible for the playoffs? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and especially in 2018, I mean, we, you know, it went perfect. Um, and a lot of people say, like, that was the best – Princeton football team to ever play and that was the best Dartmouth team to ever play um and you know that perfect season came down to that game with Dartmouth um low scoring game uh just you know just tough gritty game and um you know we knew we had a really good team and I think we had beat Monmouth earlier that year who was supposed to be you know a, a decent um you know playoff contending team and you know, definitely like the conversations were, you know, oh, you know, we, we, can, we obviously don't talk about it too much because we know we don't have playoffs. But, you know, if we did, you know, we definitely think that, you know, especially 2018 team, maybe this team too, um, could have went in the playoffs and, you know, had a second, third round exit or something. Had been very successful in the playoffs is what I'm trying to say. So um, it, we, it definitely gets talked about. Yeah. And then this year, it really felt like there was three teams like Harvard, Princeton and Dartmouth and then a big gap to the rest of the Ivies maybe like Yale here and then more of a gap is is that a fair analysis of like the landscape and do you think that's how it's going to be in the next year or two as well well yeah I mean that's that's how it's been typically um I definitely put Yale up there with the rest of them um I I put Yale up there with us Dartmouth Harvard you know the real contenders that you know are consistent coming every year with a good team and um, but I mean, you see, you see Columbia, um, beating Dartmouth 19 to zero, uh, mm. you know, which is why we got our ring. You know, you have to beat everybody, you know, you, you can't slip up. That's, that's one thing is, you know, we don't have playoffs, but really every Ivy League game is a playoff game. You know, the only ones that aren't are the out of conference games that we still treat those like playoff games. So like, um, you know, you have Columbia beating Dartmouth, um, Cornell's been getting better every year. Brown has a stellar offense with EJ Perry. He's going to go play in the league for sure, without a doubt. Um, he's probably going to be the Bushnell Cup winner. Um, you know, we, there, there are teams that are, are making the turn. And if you watch some of these Ivy League games, you know, you don't know how close or, you know, how bad or big of a victory, a big of a margin it's going to be. Because every year, I mean, everybody knows that if you win this game, if you lose this game, like it determines – whether you get a ring or not. So everybody comes in, you know, looking for heads. Everybody comes in trying to win that game. And I just think the ultimate, like, competitiveness of it kind of levels the playing field a little bit. But definitely what you said, you know, Harvard, Dartmouth, us, Yale, those are typically the teams that are, you know, you know losing one, two, maybe, you know, in some years, three games and getting a, a, getting a ring. Yeah, and that Columbia um... – Dartmouth game was crazy like you said uh Dartmouth getting shut out I would have bet my eyesight that that wasn't going to be the outcome of that I was shocked to see it were you shocked what was your reaction what was your teammates reaction to seeing Dartmouth get beat like that yeah so we had played Columbia before them and we were kind of in a weird spot with you know it was a it was a relatively close game with Columbia and we we were kind of sitting back and thinking you know are we the team that we think we are, or are these guys really good? You know, like, do they deserve to be toe to toe with us, you know, basically the entire game? Or, you know, are we just kind of, do we need to make a big jump? You know, is basically what I'm saying. Like, we can't be, you know, getting close to Columbia, you know, in a game like that, you know, and expect to win, you know, the Ivy League. So um, we were really interested to see how, you know, Columbia moved forward. Um, and, so I was surprised, definitely, the outcome of the game. You know, 19-0 is definitely not what I, you know, what anybody would have thought that game would have been. But I knew Columbia had some dogs. And, mm. um, you know, Columbia is a good team. You know, I mentioned them, you know, just a minute ago. You know, Columbia is up there. Um, you know, Brown, when they get their defense together, is going to be a really good team. Um, and so, I, I mean, I was shocked to see the 19-0. But, like I said, Columbia was a damn good team. So, um, 
you know, I, I probably would have had Dartmouth winning that game nine, you know, 90 times out of 100, you know, 99 times out of 100. Um, but I wasn't totally shocked to see Columbia win that game because I knew they had good players. Mm. And then um, last game of the season, were you at all thinking, I mean, I'm sure you must have been focused on your game, but were you, you know, looking, waiting to hear the results? Because I know the Ivies all play at the same time. Were you thinking, oh, my God, like, if Dartmouth loses, we get to be outright champs? Um, yeah, I mean, we – we just knew that going into the game, you know, that's what, that's, what's going to happen. Right. You know, it's basically us and Dartmouth are the only teams left, you know, that can get, you know, that outright ring. If somebody loses one of the other loses, we'll get the outright ring. Um, but I mean, maybe like a couple conversations, you know, we had to be pen, you know, if we wanted to ring at all, we, we needed yeah. to, because we weren't, we weren't going to sit there and plan for Dartmouth to lose, you know, and kind of go into pen thinking, Oh, you know, we can, you know, mess around a little bit, you know, not really take this game seriously. Um, you know, risk that, you know, we weren't going to do that. So um, I, you know, I, I, I don't know what the final score of the Dartmouth, I don't even, do they play Brown the last game of the year? Um, that sounds right. I'm not a hundred percent sure. <laughs> Brown, I know they had like Brown and Cornell. Cause I talked to a couple of games, at, a couple of guys after the game at the Dartmouth game. And they were saying, you know, they were talking about how, Oh, you know, we have this easy road out. Um, and I was telling them, Hey, watch out for EJ Perry, man. And Brown, you know, they can, they can get you. So, um, I don't know. I don't know what the final score is. I don't know who they played, but um, I do know that, you know, where our heads were, you know, we were, we needed to be Penn. So that's what we were doing. What was the, what was the feeling like when the game ended and you guys had secured an Ivy League title? It was a bittersweet. I mean, I'm sure for a lot of guys, <clears throat> especially the young guys, you know, all they're thinking about is the Ivy League championship, you know, oh, we're getting rings, you know, let's take pictures, all this stuff. You know, I'm on Franklin field, you know, with a lot of these other seniors, you know, the guys that took the year off and we're just kind of like, damn, dude, you know, this is like that, that was it, you know, right there. Um, and we did what we needed to do, you know, we won. And, you know, I was definitely, you know, beside myself, you know, with, with happiness and joy and excitement. But, um, you know, I definitely had a couple moments where, you know, I'm seeing, you know, my teammates' families and my family and just kind of being like, wow, this is crazy. You know, I'm in the old Eagle Stadium right now. You know, we just won an Ivy League championship, mm. you know, career you know this is the climax of my career right here in this moment you know so like and I you know I'm not really the type of person to get sentimental about stuff like that but dude the emotions were flowing after that game that was um you know just that was everything we had worked for had come together right there so it's kind of crazy yeah another game I really wanted to hear about was directly before then on November 13th the Yale game 35 to 20 a great win um, but in some ways that almost doesn't represent what a nail biter it was. And you guys were, were down at some points. Tell me a little bit about what kind of game that was and how it all went down. <clears throat> so what we had come into that game, we just lost to Dartmouth. Uh, and, you know, for a little bit, you know, just honestly, like for a couple of days, you know, the, the general feeling around the team was a little bit off. You know, like we we'd been undefeated up to that point. Obviously, we never lost a game. Some of these freshmen had never lost a game. You know, sophomores haven't lost a game either because they had their season canceled. Um, so nobody, you know, those young kids didn't really know how to deal with loss. You know, and you know, I I think I've lost maybe like seven or eight games in my career, um, especially my freshman year. We went I think five and five. Um, so it was up to the leaders and up to the seniors to kind of get these young guys back on board, you know, and get these young guys refocused, you know, tell them, Hey, it's not the end of the world. We have all of our goals in front of us. That's where our offensive coordinator, uh, Mike Willis was telling us in our offensive meeting, you know, we still have all of our goals in front of us. Mm. And we've got a team coming to town this week. That's, you know, ready to kick your ass. Like this is, this is a really good football team. So, um, you know, we go into Yale and, and it was what we expected it to be. I mean, they, their defense is, you know, throws everything at you. They run a ton of different coverages. Um, they've got great athletes. Um, their offense is high power. They have a great quarterback. Um, and, you know, they got big guys up front too. So, um, so uh, you know, it was everything we thought it would be. And, you know, I think really the turning point in that game was our two-minute drive to go in before half. Um, you know, Cole was absolutely perfect with where he was putting the ball. Dylan was getting open, getting us that big chunk play that we needed to get down to the field and then finish off the drive. And that was basically when time was expiring. Um, and we went in with the lead after that, which kind of, I think, turned the tables a bit. 
Mm -hmm. One of your most individually um, impressive performances has to be against Brown. You had um, 11 receptions for 175 receiving yards. You know, you just absolutely went off that game. What, what was that feeling like? How, how did you make all those catches and all those uh, big, uh, big receiving yards happen? Um, that was definitely, I, I you know, receivers you know, talk about it. We I actually just talked about it uh, the other day with the guys at, at dinner. Um, um, <clears throat> you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Okay. Um, so I was just talking about talking to, about it with the guys at, at dinner. And, you know, I was saying, like, that was the most fun I've ever had in a football game before. Um, just because it was a shootout. And, you know, the Brown offense, like I said before, is extremely high-powered. And they were keeping up with us the whole time. It was only, a, you know, two touchdown. At points, it was a three-touchdown, um, you know, deficit for them. But the entire game up through the fourth quarter and the entire game was, you know, two-touchdown lead for us. We'd score. We'd go sit down and be like, all right, you know, now we get to relax a little bit. And then they come back and they'd score and be like, oh, my God, like, here we go again. Like, let's go do it. And it just turned into this crazy shootout. And, I mean, you know, we were, you know, we were dicing them up. They were dicing us up. And, you know, we get on the bus and we're just like, check the stat lines, man. Like, that was, that was, cool. <laughs> you know, that was insane. And, you know, Dylan had a hell of a game. Andre had a hell of a game. Cole was tremendous. Um, you know, so that was, that was definitely the most fun I've ever had in the game, like, consistently throughout the game. I mean, it was just, it was just a complete air raid on both sides. So like, it was, it was so much fun. Yeah. I, and I follow that. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure you probably do that. Like Ivy league football stats account on Instagram where they give like a player of the week and stuff like that. Oh yeah. That's just the Ivy league. I, I follow the Ivy league, just like the Ivy league uh, football like page, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, and, they, and you always see EJ Perry with these just incredible numbers and stuff. Oh, yeah. How would you characterize his style of play after seeing him live? So um, after seeing him live and, you know, honestly, you, some might consider me a, you know, Brown football fan. Like I love watching them play. Um, and EJ Perry, I mean, what I think about when what I think about EJ is, you know, he is just so, um, you know, calm and collected. Um, he's just making the right decision time after time again. And he's got the arm to, you know, make these crazy throws too. Um, you know, he's got a good pair of receivers. Um, West Rocket and I uh, can't remember the other guy's name, but just a jump ball threat, deep guy, deep ball guy. Um, and, you know, he's, he's a stud. I mean, not only that, but he can get it done with his feet too, which we didn't know going into that game against him. Like our defense was not prepared for him to be scrambling and running. I know this because I talked to a bunch of our DBs and linebackers after, you know, they were like, this guy is ridiculous. I mean, he's a total freak. Um, and I talked to him a little bit after the game and just had to just like say, dude, you're, you're crazy. Like you're a hell of a football player. Um, so watching him play, he's definitely a guy that makes all of his proper reads. And, you know, I think that's a product of good coaching and a lot of practice at that. So yeah, he's a, he's a really good football player. Yeah. It's crazy, man. Um, another aspect of what you do well is you return punts. What makes a good punt returner and what's your, what's your style like? Um, I think it's just consistency. Um, I I'd been doing it for a long time, like in high school, um, peewee even. And, I think to be a punt return, it's kind of like kicking, you know, like it's really just you um, back there. And that ball goes however high it goes in the air for five seconds, four or five seconds typically is the hang time. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a lot of pressure, you know, especially if you're not used to it. Um, and, you know, every time you catch the ball, you could either catch it or you could drop it. And so you just really got to be consistent. And I think positive, like just having a positive mindset about it, like, okay, let's not think of this as, okay, I'm, you know, I might drop this ball. I got to think of that as, okay, I might catch this ball and take it to the house. You know, this is another opportunity for me to get the ball and go make a, you know, a positive play. So, um, I mean, it's definitely nerve wracking, um, but, you know, once you get used to it, you settle in the game, especially like after you get on offense once already, you know, you get kind of hit a couple times and you get loosened up and you go back there. It's not that big of a deal, but the first one of the game is typically the one that's like, I right, get your heart, you know, pumping, <laughs> especially when all these big ass dudes are running down right after you trying to kill you. So, um, yeah. Yeah. There's um, a guy I know he um, he's currently a senior at the high school that I went to. Um, and he, he's kind of like similar to you. He's um, probably around five, nine. Um, 
uh, but he's this great punt return. He's got like maybe five punt return touchdowns on the season, given it's high school uh, football, but still a really amazing player. Um, and one thing that I thought was funny about him is despite all these great returns, he doesn't believe in fair catching. He said that to a bunch of people. So one game against, I think it was Norton High School, uh, the ball came and he just got absolutely cleaned out. Like, but it was a totally legal hit. He got absolutely destroyed. What would you tell a kid like Johnny that doesn't believe in uh, fair catching? Well, I will say first and foremost, that happens to all of us at some point. You just get your clock cleaned. <laughs> it happened to me in high school one time, and I actually threw up the fair catch. So if I'm, you know, I, I shouldn't believe in it either because it didn't protect me then. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, really at the, at the collegiate level, you know, the fair catch is typically, not typically, but sometimes can be the coach's call. So we'll go, you know, return safe, you know, basically is what we call it. And we'll go out on the field. And I'll, I just know that I'm fair catching this wherever I, you know, as soon as they punt it, I'm throwing up the fair catch line. Um, and then other times it's your own discretion. You just have to have really good, you know, peripheral vision. You know, you're looking up, you got to see these guys coming at you. And the, the challenge is, you know, you don't know if that's your guy or somebody else. <laughs> so, you know, you really just got to, you know, make your best judgment call. And, you know, I think, I think our, our special teams coordinator always says, you know, be decisive, um, you know, a, a, you know, a quick decision is a good decision. You know, don't think about it too much, you know, don't be out there and then, you know, the ball's coming down and, you know, throw up the fair catch at the last second, drop the ball, or, you know, don't throw up the fair catch when you thought you might've thrown up the fair catch. Like just don't just, just make a decision and live with it. So, um, you know, for him to say he doesn't believe in fair catches, that's pretty ballsy. Um, and, you know, there's a couple guys out there. I think um, the Dartmouth guy, the Dartmouth uh, dude who returns punts maybe has like three fair catches on the year. Like he doesn't <laughs> like anything. And I'm like, dude, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. That, um, and it's too, cause you're like, you're at zero miles an hour. And so when you make a move, like you're either totally breaking someone's ankles or you're like going to get murdered. <laughs> <laughs> right yes. you know, like what is I mean do you have a go-to move when you when you get the ball do you like to go forward do you like to go laterally um it depends on you know how much time I have I think you know if I'm you know not fair catching and you know I'm seeing somebody getting really close to me and the ball is coming and I you know I catch it and I immediately drop my head and he's like right in front of me I'm getting the hell out of the way I'm moving side to side as fast as I can if I have time um my preference is to really split as many defenders as I can, just get vertical as fast as I can. Because as soon as you pass, you know, two or three guys, which are typically the gunners and the fast guys on the team, you know, they're trying to contain, right? But if you split them, you're left with some linebackers, some linemen that you can outrun. So I think, you know, if you split them and then hit the sideline, I've never returned a pump for a touchdown in my career, like at Princeton at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know who should be taking my advice. Dude, what the hell? <laughs> there, you there you go I don't know I don't know who should be taking my advice but um you know I think that's how you get the most yards at least is, is trying to get vertical as quick as possible um you know because moving around dancing side to side you could spring one big but at the same time you could also get tackled for loss and you know whatever yeah that's fascinating like you said though that once you get by those fast guys it really breaks it down especially if you're a, a speedy wide receiver how would you describe the distinction between returning kicks and returning punts? Like what stylistically, how is that different? Um, it's a lot different. I haven't returned a kickoff since high school. Um, we have our running backs do that. Um, but from what I remember, the, a kickoff is typically end over end and it's not really moving side to side as much. A lot of these punts are like knuckleballs in the air. Um, you know, they're going front, back left and right you know the wind is a huge factor um so and and the ball could be end over end it could be sideways it can be rotating any direction so it's it's definitely I, I think it's a lot easier to return kicks than it is to return punts you know I think a lot of people agree with me on that um and it's just all up to the ball I mean there's the flight of the path of the ball you know how long the ball hangs in the air it's it's totally different it's a totally different ball game I'd love to switch gears a little bit um, because one of the reasons, uh, like I told you, I love interviewing Ivy League um, athletes is because you guys are well-rounded and there's a lot going on. So I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask a little bit about the academic experience that you've got at Princeton. 
what would you say has been your you know favorite or most interesting course you've taken at Princeton? Um, <clears throat> it's funny you'd ask because honestly, the, my favorite course has nothing to do with my major. <laughs> Um, it was a music class. It was, a. Uh, it's called 262. It's like classic rock. Um, and it was like, you know, all, basically the origin of classic rock up until, uh, it, you know, it started to transform a little bit into hip hop. And that was, I mean, that was the most, I mean, how could it not be fun? Like you're sitting in lecture, you're listening to the Beatles and, and <laughs> you know, all these, you know, famous artists and, you know, you get, you get tested on, you know, they play a song and you write down the song, you, know, you write down the artist, you write down, you know, what year it was made or whatever. And, um, that was probably the most fun I've ever had in class. And, you know, the whole football team was in on that class too. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Who's the most impressive professor that you've, you've gotten to meet or take a class from at Princeton? I would say um, Professor Larson, who's actually not at, at Princeton anymore. Um, don't know where he's teaching now I just I literally just looked this up too um but he taught a religion class and he used to play football at Texas Tech um mm. uh, and I, I think he was an outside linebacker and you know we just immediately connected and like talked so much and I think that's something that I wish I had done more over my course at Princeton is really try to get to connect with my professors a little bit more but we had that football connection he was a really cool guy um you know we'd go out to lunch and get lunch together and um, you know, the stories that he shared about all the things that he studied in different countries, and, you know, around the world. He was just so, such an interesting guy. Um, and, you know, I'd say Professor Larson was definitely not only the, you know, the, the coolest professor I had, but one of the most interesting as well. Who's the most impressive student you met at Princeton? Um, let's see. Um, there's a couple, you know, I, I think it's really impressive when students balance not only academics, but other things as well. Um, so there's a couple guys in the team, man, that are just academic weapons that still do the <laughs> same things that I do. And I, you know, I'm just like, how in the hell do you even do that? Um, you know, at first I'd, I'd probably say one of my good buddies, Mitch Strobel, um, he's a receiver as well, who's doing uh, financial engineering. And, uh, you know, the amount of work that he has to do, and not only that, but the the type of work that he has to do is just, it looks like Chinese to, you know, a normal guy. So <laughs> he's doing that. And then he's work, waking up for a 6 a.m. lift too. And, get, and I think he has like a 3.8 or something like that. And it's the hardest major at Princeton. You know, it's obviously it's at Princeton. It's the hardest major at Princeton. You're a Princeton football player. You know, I guess that's why, he, you know, he's going to work, you know, investment banking in New York, you know, and he wow. has the offers. And he, yeah, he's going to be one of the most successful guys I know for sure. Perfect transition to my next question. Do you have an idea of what you're doing after Princeton? Yeah, um, I well, there, there's, two, there's two things. So um, I'm actually about to go meet with the training staff um, tomorrow, and we're gonna get a plan together for a pro day. So I do have a pro day coming up. Um, and really, you know, that for me, you know, I talked to my head coach, but I talked to Coach Chase about it. And, you know, he was saying, yeah, like a couple of teams have like, you know, showed interest or anything, but it's going to be a long shot, you know, obviously five, nine, you know, I'm not going to run a four, three, 40. So, um, you know, I got to train as hard as I can to try to get my foot in the door. Um, so, you know, and, and then, you know, I talked to my parents about it too, because I was honestly kind of tempted to kind of be like, you know, I have all this time in spring semester to focus on school, you know, you know, have fun with my friends before I graduate. But, you know, honestly, I think the best decision was, look, you only have one shot at ever doing something like this ever again. So, you know, you might as well just at least say, you know, you try, you know, and go out there and do it. You know, if it doesn't happen, at least you could say you try. So um, I'm doing that. I'm getting a pro day set up um, with a couple other guys. And then um, I do, if, if none of that works out, I'm going into the financial services sector. So um, I have two job offers right now, one in Philadelphia, one near Philadelphia, and another one in Princeton, actually, um, commercial real estate. So. I actually want to end up somewhere down south, so I'm still looking for jobs, um, but definitely something finance related, whether that's wealth management, portfolio management, um, commercial real estate was really interesting when I had my internship, so um, yeah. Yeah, I was, um, uh, when I interviewed Spencer Cassell, uh, the starting left tackle for Harvard, he said something like, you know, I don't think anyone here referring to Harvard football has has never thought about the next level because it's a dream of everyone's. And yeah. so it is, 
you know, pretty cool to hear you, you know, putting yourself on the line, going for it, giving it a try. Um, and it's also something that is not, not unheard of whatsoever. There's plenty of Ivy League football guys in the NFL. Are there, are there any recent Princeton guys in the NFL that you know? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, a couple of receivers, um, Stephen Carlson, Jesper Horstead, John Lovett. Those were, those were all guys a part of the, uh, the perfect season back in 2018. Um, and those guys were all in the NFL. We had a tight end, Graham Adamitis, who's still um, around in the NFL right now. Um, I think he's a free agent. Hold on a second. And um, so we've had a couple guys go recently. Um, and I'm, two, two of my roommates are also doing pro days with me. Um, Jeremiah Tyler, who's uh, number five, you know, uh, Bushnell Cup finalist, probably going to win it. Um, and DeLon Stallworth, who's a cornerback, actually didn't play a lot this year. He was, he was injured, um, but he's a stud too. So all three of us are going to be on like a similar program all working out together. So that'll be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it, honestly. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. And tell me a little bit about um, during the season, the routine. I was curious to hear, you know, what is the the weekly routine of a Ivy League football starter in season? I'm sure it's a lot to balance the school mm -hmm. and the, you know, what time are you guys getting up? Are you hitting lifts? Are you watching film or practicing? You know, what, what's this routine look like? Yeah, man, it is. It's, it's a lot to handle, um, especially, you know, as a first year freshman coming in, like it's a total. <laughs> so um, typically how it goes, you know, we have our games on Saturday. I'll, I'll start with that. Let's, you know, say we just played, say we just played Dartmouth, right? Everybody's all pissed off. We lost, you know, all this stuff. Um, Sunday we get in, we have film review first thing in the morning. Um, actually not first thing in the morning. We get, we get to sleep. Um, we get into the training room. We check in. You know, if anybody's injured, they go through that. You know, bumps and bruises and whatnot get reviewed by the training staff. And then you go into film review. You go over what you did wrong. You know, um, and that's about it for Sunday. You go into positional meetings too. It's probably it's it's a long day. I'd say it's probably like eleven to like six. Um, it's a pretty pretty big chunk of the day gone. And then we get Monday off, which is nice. Um, and then Tuesdays are padded practice and meetings. Wednesday's padded practice and meetings. Thursday is a walk through tempo practice and meetings. We have meetings every day except for Monday. And then um, Friday is like, we call it fast Friday where everybody, you know, you don't have your pads on, you don't have a helmet on. It's basically a walkthrough, but it's full speed walkthrough. So, you know, it's, it's like the last day to prepare before the game, you know, get all the plays down, run it fast, run it right. Um, and yeah, and then we'll be in, then we played, then we play Yale on Saturday. Crazy. Mm -hmm. So you're a Florida guy. Yeah. What's the, do you, do you spend your um, summers in, in Princeton or do you go back home? Um, the last two summers I've spent at Princeton uh, mm -hmm. with an internship, you know, working out with the team. Um, that's typically what we, what we like guys to do is, is stay here in summer so they can, we can all be together and practice. Mm -hmm. um, it's not mandatory. Like a lot of the big, like FBS schools will do it where everybody's back in the summer. Every, you know, it's basically like an extended spring season. It's all optional for us. So um, we like guys to stay in the summer, but my freshman year summer, I went back home. I had had enough of Princeton after my freshman year. <laughs> I was ready to get out. Um, and so I went home and yeah, I'm from West Palm. Um, you know, basically my entire family's down there and uh, yeah, just go to the beach, hang out with friends, chill out. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is it's a nice place to live. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, you know, Florida can be a little crazy too. Um, I'm sure you, you know, Florida man on the news here. <laughs> uh, you know, we definitely got our fair share of kooks, but um, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, and you know, financially, I mean, there's no, there's no state tax in Florida. So um, it's a great place to live, you know, great place to start a family. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm glad I grew up there, honestly. Do you see yourself headed back there in the future or, or are you going to be maybe in Princeton or New York? Like, where would you see yourself? So not New York. I don't really, I, I mean, I've, I've had my time in the Northeast is what I think, you know, I, I, you know, I enjoyed my time up here. Um, I'm ready to get back down South somewhere, whether that be Florida. I'm, I really like Texas in my year off. I lived with a couple guys. Um, some of my current roommates actually in Dallas and it was just, it was an amazing city. It was mm. kind of everything that I wanted. Like it's not New York where, you know, New York people are going to kill me, but you know, it's like, it's dirty and, you know, smack. <laughs> Dallas was very clean. Dallas was very clean and it was spacious. Like 
you know, Dallas Fort Worth is a gigantic city. It's like in terms of like how much area it covers, it's huge. Um, it's kind of like LA and I, you know, I've never been to LA, but I know that LA kind of gets that, you know, stereotype of being, you know, a giant sprawling city. Um, and that's, that's really how Dallas was, but everybody had their own space, you know, houses had, lawns you know but you were still 15 minutes from downtown and you know so dallas was really cool i really enjoyed dallas and it wouldn't be the worst thing ever to go back to west palm either so um somewhere in florida somewhere in, in texas georgia could be cool too somewhere down south yeah yeah a lot of people are really um excited about texas personally i am a northeast guy i'm from um like a half hour outside of boston um and but now i'm, I'm down here in raleigh for school um, yeah. at NC State and I'll tell you it's a lot different it's not it's definitely not as beautiful in the fall I'll say that but um, people are very nice there's a lot of good manners um, it's it's a bit warmer which is nice it was like 70 degrees yesterday which yeah. is crazy for December 2nd um, it's just a nice a nice place to be so it's definitely like different areas of the country are definitely worth it exploring for sure yeah. is NC State um, you said it's in Raleigh is it in like the city yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and that, you know, I'm like right off campus, um, which is nice. Um, and then football stadium, Carter Finley is also in Raleigh. So we have had some incredible games this year. I got to storm the field after we beat Clemson, which was crazy. <laughs> almost, almost got hurt jumping down. Cause you know, some stadiums, like if you come from the sideline, like I was behind where Dabo Sweeney was, and then I was coming down the thing and it was just a little bit too far of a drop. And it was like, I, my knees buckled, but then I popped right up and like sprinted on the field. <laughs> and then, so we beat, I was home for Thanksgiving, but we beat uh, UNC. Um, I don't know if you saw that. It was, a, it came on crazy. We were down, like uh, two scores with like a minute and 40 left, scored a, uh, a touchdown, onside kicked, and then another touchdown. NC State students stormed the field, and uh, some dude broke his fucking legs jumping down to storm the field. And as they carted him off the field to go to the hospital, he was like laying down in the stretcher, like tied up. He threw up the wolf pack sign like this. <laughs> oh, my God, that's so funny, that's hilarious. Yeah, the, the drop from the side of the of the stands is far. Because I remember after I made that Harvard catch, I had thought we won the game. So I run to the sideline and I'm about to jump into the crowd. And I kind of second guess myself. I was like, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of high up, you know. know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely I can see people getting hurt by that. Well, and Harvard's another place that um storms a lot. My dad played um for Harvard in 1985. He graduated, so we would always go to the games when the game was at uh, Harvard. And yeah. so every time, basically, the Harvard students will storm the field and it gets hectic. Yeah. Um, and kids will, will jump down those like concrete barriers at Harvard Stadium. Yeah. The, the, the game this year was nuts, man. What, they had what, like 40,000 people go, 45,000 people? Yeah. I was That's at the people. Yale Bowl. Um, yeah. Why? And I think it came down to the last drive, right, for Harvard. Great game, dude. Yeah, it was insane. Um, I didn't watch it, but I remember looking on, on Instagram and, you know, people that I know were at the game and posting pictures. And, like, it was basically almost, like, sold out. If it wasn't sold out, it was nuts. You know, I'd never seen an Ivy League game sell so many tickets. You know, we're lucky to get probably, you know, 10,000 people at our games and 15,000 people maybe, you know, at Harvard or when we played Harvard. But you know, 40,000, 45,000 for an Ivy. I mean, it is Harvard, Yale, so it has that kind of ring to it. Yeah. So it sells a lot of tickets, but that was crazy to see that. That must have been so much fun to play in. Yeah, I think it's just the mystique of it and the the legend that it's gone back so much and that it is, like, a f fierce rivalry. And, like, the schools, I mean, it, it just gets routed. I think all the alumni, not all of them, but so many of them will come out for the game and – um I, it's funny too when you're there like kids will um, chant like safety school at each other <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm like well that's the biggest joke in the world that it's that either one of those schools is a is a safety school and I came across one video um, on YouTube it was like I want to say 2006 or something that uh, I think yeah Yale students went and they handed out cards to the Harvard fans and they're like, Oh, it's going to say go crimson or something. And then it said, what did it say? Harvard sucks or something like that. It said something, but it was definitely not what they told him it was going to say. <laughs> I saw that too. That was so funny. 
I can't believe that. Or it said go Yale or something like that. It was hilarious. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What atmosphere, what like stadium or game has been the most fun to play in? Um, I would probably say, I'd say Harvard. Um, there's just something different when we go over to Harvard. Um, I, I really like playing at Penn too. Franklin Field is so historical and it's a really beautiful place to play too. Um, you know, just the, the rust in the stadium. And then, you know, you know, you see, you know, you turn, I don't know what direction it would be, I guess maybe North. Um, and you see, you see Philly, you know, it, it opens, it's a U shape, right? You get, you get the whole Franklin Field, Frank, Franklin Stadium. And then you face the other way and you could see the skyscrapers of Philly, like right behind it as you're playing. It's, it's so cool. And then obviously the Coliseum is, you know, top two, maybe not two, you know, places to play. So um, and it's, it's really just like the, just the architecture of it. I think maybe it's just, it just feels like you're in some sort of ancient Roman battle. You know, it's, it's, it's super cool. I love playing there. What was it like playing at Yankee stadium? I know it was, uh 2019 it was a, a tough loss to Yale right uh Dartmouth Dartmouth tough loss to Dartmouth um well but like Yankee Stadium what was the atmosphere like was that sick yeah it was really sick um I'd never been there before um and it was a good turnout too I don't know how many people oh, cool, sorry. I don't know how many people actually went um but it definitely it wasn't by any means like sold out but there was definitely a good turnout and uh, just the stadium itself. We had gotten a tour before we got to eat at like the clubhouse or whatever um, the day before. So just kind of appreciating all the history and it was super awesome. You know, they treated us really well. We get into the, into the locker room and like these showers were phenomenal. You know, they've got, they've got a, you know, shaving cream for you. They've got different soaps. Like this is not the typical treatment in an Ivy league, you know, (laughs) away game you know let me say that you know you know you travel to these places and they'll they'll you're lucky to have hot water you know and <laughs> so when we played at yankee when we played at yankee stadium that was it felt like we were some sort of like superstar team coming in so it was, it was it, that was honestly really cool yeah what are what are the opposing fans like i know you're saying the conditions on the road it, you know Ivy League kids, is it, is it a misconception to say that they don't get rowdy? Do they get rowdy or do they just throw like textbooks at you? Like, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, they're sipping tea in the stadium and just kind of, you know, <laughs> studying for their next exam. Um, honestly, I mean, for us, at least at Princeton, um, there's a funny story. Of, this was probably like week seven and I'm going down to the stadium. I'm, maybe I'm going down to Canon to get some food. That's like the eating club or whatever. And, and I'm, I'm walking past and there's these two kids and this other club that's like kind of like stereotype for being like really, you know, heavy nerds, you know, mm-hmm. really studious guys or whatever. And um, they're out there throwing the pigskin. And I was like, that just like hit my heart, you know, it just hit my heart. <laughs> that is such a cool thing to see at Princeton. So there, I honestly think that most of the support comes from other athletes. Like we love going out and watching, you know, soccer play, women's soccer, basketball, you know, everything, lacrosse, we're really close with lacrosse, wrestling you know, we support the other teams and they support us. So like, though, they definitely get rowdy, you know, the athletes definitely get rowdy. And um, anytime there's, you know, normal students, I'll call them normal students, just come to the game. Like that's super cool too. But um, opposing fans, I don't really know. I mean, I, the only, the only thing I can really think of, of an interaction I had with opposing fans was at Brown actually this year. Um, and we're going back into the tunnel and they're like, you know, yelling at us, like you suck, all this stuff. And like, I mean, that's about it. It's typical stuff. Nothing. nothing yeah. Crazy. yeah. That's cool about that story with those guys. I mean, football is, uh, it's pretty, pretty universal. It's funny. You uh, bring up those other sports. I'd love to hear your thoughts on Princeton's basketball team because they've been looking very good. Ethan Wright, some of those guys yeah. have been watching games. I have been a couple. Um, I know some of those guys, they, they had one game where like three dudes had a career high at the same time. There's a career high threes, maybe. Ethan Wright, um, uh, what do you, he sink nine threes the other, the other game or something like that? I, I don't remember. Um, he, 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 had, he scored so many points. He's just. Yeah, it was nuts. Um, and we have a couple guys. Um, I mentioned Cannon earlier. It's like our eating club. Um, it's basically like a co-ed fraternity sorority where you eat and do social activities together and stuff like that. Um, and we have a bunch of athletes in that club and there's a couple basketball players in there 
So um, I've only watched a couple games, but that every game that I've watched, they've looked spectacular. And I remember it really caught my eye the first game when they played, um, who actually I don't even know how to team is Rutgers Camden, like their Camden campus. Mm -hmm. um, and they had beaten that, like, I think by like 50 or something like that. Like Camden scored maybe 20 points and we had like 70. I was like, all right, you know, maybe these, these guys are going to be good. Yeah. Would you say Princeton has one rival that you would single out? Obviously, all the Ivies you get to see them each year. Is there, a, is there a school that's the biggest rival to you guys? So naturally, it should be Harvard and Yale. Um, you know, in our fight song, you know, it says crash through that line of blue. You know, we're talking about Yale. We're talking about Harvard. Um, and we get a bonfire, you know, if we beat Harvard and Yale. So that's one thing that we kind of work towards in the season. Um, you know, beating those guys, first and foremost, it's just like a structural rivalry that's just been built in for, you know, hundreds of years. So, um, and then, but really, honestly, I'd say recently it's got to be Dartmouth. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's weird because, you know, Dartmouth isn't typically a team that, you know, pisses us off the most, but they're just the best football team that's been around, you know, at least when, you know, as I've been here, Dartmouth's always been, you know, top dog, top one, top two. Um, so Dartmouth has kind of turned into an interesting rivalry over the past couple of years I think yeah for sure man and you in high school um were like all county all state in track and powerlifting too that's crazy you've, you've got sort of an athletic background so it, I did track my freshman year um and I I was like all county um and track my freshman year um and then powerlifting I did my junior and senior year um and I went to states my senior year yeah um so i i honestly dude i think track is i that, that can't be a sport to me dude i think run, i think of running as a punishment you know if i don't have a football in my hand or if i'm not running a route or something like that i i hate running i hate like if i'm just running around a track i can't do it so you you wouldn't even consider like track kids college athletes i <laughs> i wouldn't say that um you know <laughs> you just said it wasn't a sport for me, like I couldn't consider yeah. that, you know, like that to me is I, if anything, I have the utmost respect for them for doing that because I could like that just to me is running around in a, in a circle like that and full tilt sprint and like all the other things they do too, you know, pole vault, long jump. Um, I would do long jump. I did long jump in my freshman year too. I was, I really liked that, but I had to run the 400 and that 400 and 800, I think are the hardest events to run just yeah. You're sprinting the entire time. And I think, you know, every third 400 I'd run probably like in throughout the course of the season, I would be yakking, you know, I'd run off the side and just throw up after four. Like I couldn't, I couldn't sustain that for three more years, dude. I hated it. I gotta, I gotta reveal something to you. I did college track for two years and, yeah. let me, and I coached track last spring at my high school. So let me, let me tell you, let me tell you something, Jake, it is a sport. <laughs> it's, it's more of a sport than football. It's the oldest sport in the world. Okay. People have been running since they had legs, since we got out of the water, since we weren't fish anymore. Uh, they were doing it back in the old Greek and Roman days. Yep. The smartest philosophers to ever walk the earth, right, would root for track and wrestling. Those were the sports. They were throwing the discus. They were wrestling. They were running laps. And by the way, it's not a circle. It's an oval. And you should know that because you're an Ivy League student. So yeah, track is honestly, one of the greatest sports that's ever existed. Football is not in the Olympics either, man. So maybe you got <laughs> Yeah. What, when was football invented? Like 180 years ago? Some I should know. <laughs> Princeton and, and, and Rutgers was the first game ever. So. Oh, yeah. That, that actually true, man. When we, when we walk into our stadium, we have a uh, – a uh, big like decal that says like where football began. It's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. And it, like I was kind of joking about earlier, but it is kind of crazy to think 15 national championships, like the program has been around forever. And it's like, it's cool to think about. So it's like the group of seniors, when you were a freshman, you know them. And then when they were freshmen, those guys knew a different set of seniors. And if you keep doing that, you would eventually go back to those first guys wearing a bunch of like leather caps, winning national championships yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and it, it's crazy because we, uh, I talked about this the other day with a couple of my friends, like there was a video that was posted on Princeton's uh, Instagram page and it was back, you know, however long ago, early 1900s or something. Um, 
and you know or, or when when they first you know started having like actual like motion pictures and there was a d lineman that came in it was like a touchdown pass in the red zone actually it was an incomplete pass in the red zone and it was just like part of a collage that they were doing like celebrating 150 years of princeton football or whatnot and um the dn comes in around the end and doesn't even try to tackle the quarterback he just comes in and punches this dude right in the face. <laughs> and he's like, holy crap, dude. Like, it, it was – it's so different now. Like, everything about it is different. But, like, dude got completely clocked, like, knocked out. People used to die in these games. Like, yeah. it's insane. It's crazy to think about. It's wild. And it, you see, like, the old footage of, like, like Pistol Pete Maravich. Like, he's, like, the all-time NCAA league scorer in basketball. But then you're, like – everyone always like comments on Instagram. They're like, all right, like imagine Kyrie though. Like this guy, Pete Maravich with his little moves, like imagine what Kyrie would do to this guy's ankles. Like you, I I imagine you guys going back and playing one of these teams. Yeah, no, it wouldn't be fair. I mean, I think just like, you know, as, as the sport progresses, like you get people who really care about it and you get people who, you know, learn more about it and new things come out about it science starts to get into the sport and like you just set up your athletes in such better ways to like perform well so you know you do see all these comments like oh this guy's playing against janitors you know this and that (laughs) amj lebron debate and everything but like it's really not an apples to apples comparison at all because you know he grew up with what he grew up with lebron grew up with what he grew up with so it's really just how how far of a distance is it between him and his competition that he played against compared to how far did MJ have, you know, the distance between him and his competition. That's I think that's how people should look at it. Not, you know, you know, it's not apples to apples, like I said. To what extent or capacity do you think you'll be in, do you think you'll be um, involved in football like in the rest of your life? Like, do you think you'd you'll coach it or will you just keep up with football? Like you know, to what extent will you be involved? Yeah, I'll definitely keep up with it. I mean, I play fantasy. Um, I love playing Madden. Uh, and, you know, I, I really, you know, actually recently it's been calling me is, is coaching or doing something with football. Um, so, you know, if anything, you know, I'll, you know, give a shot to the NFL, give a shot to finance. And if I end up, don't, you know, those don't end up working out or I don't like it, um, I feel like I could be a pretty good coach. Um, you know, especially with the way that Princeton coaches you, like they really teach you to learn the game. Um, you know, they tell you why we run these plays. They tell you what we're looking for and everything. Um, so, and I, I, I mean, football has been in my life since I was, you know, five, six years old or whatever, when I could first start playing. So, you know, it, it really feels so weird now to be done mm. because I have all the spare time now. And like, it's almost like, what is my, all right, I got to figure out, you know, what is my purpose right now? dude because it's crazy you're just like you've been living your life the same way for you know however many years 16 years you know playing football and then you're just done you know it, I, I wasn't even expecting that after the pen game after the pen game ended I was like oh my god like I don't have a I don't have a meeting tomorrow I don't have film tomorrow <laughs> I don't have lift tomorrow like I'm sleeping until 2 p.m I'm uh, you know like I'm you know I don't know what to do so, you know, uh, it's been a weird adjustment for a lot of, for a lot of us, you know, it's just like, you know, get in your books, you get more time to study. And, you know, now we're like, wow, like we have all this time. Like it's, it's crazy. It's, it's definitely a huge adjustment. What would you tell a kid watching that said, Hey, one day, you know, I want to be just like Jake. I want to be a D one football player an Ivy league football player. I want to be, you know, all Ivy and, and get to play in these games and, and then get my shot at the NFL. What would you tell a, you know, a middle schooler or a high school age kid that they should do um, to get where you're at? Um, it's going to sound so cliche, but like, I don't think it could ever be overstated. It's just like do well in school um, because, you know, you see all these athletes, you know, they become hood legends, right. <clears throat> you know, back in, in West Palm, like we had so many guys that had so much talent and, you know, just pissed it away because they couldn't keep a 2 0, you know, just didn't go to class, just didn't do anything. Um, you know, we had multiple guys that could have went and played, I swear to God, at like Alabama could have went and played at like FSU, any of these schools. Mm. And, you know, they were just doing the wrong things, you know, not doing well in school. Um, so I'd say like, you know, just keep your GPA up, you know, take, advanced classes take AP classes and it keeps your options open because you know if you don't want to go to one of these you know 
smaller schools, maybe like you're getting recruited like D2, D3, you know, somewhere out in, you know, Vermont or something where you don't want to go there, you know, you have good grades and you could go to this other school, you know, down the street or something, you know, you, you just have more options. So I think having good grades is, you know, one thing that, you know, I never really understood growing up. Like my parents just kind of like enforced that on me, like made sure I had good grades. And, you know, without that, I would have never not even close would have been able to get into Princeton. So that's one thing I would say, just keep your head down, keep it in your books, study. Absolutely. Jake, thanks so much for coming on the Young Shakespeare podcast. Dan, you're the man. Thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, huge shout out to Jake for coming on the podcast. Good luck at your uh, pro day, man. And congrats on all your success as an Ivy League football player. Look forward to uh, doing more interviews with some Princeton guys soon. Everyone, uh, Go uh, get a ticket to some Princeton games next year and uh, like and subscribe and tune in for the next episode of the Young Shakespeare podcast. Thank you.